Hello, everybody. Welcome to the uh, panel Automata for the People. My name is Walt Williams. I write as WBJ Williams. Um, just going to um, introduce the panel, then give everybody on the panel a chance to introduce themselves. Um, so, uh, the panel description for millennia, people have dreamed of created beings that are humanoid but not human. They show up around the world, automated guardians and Buddhist legend, mechanical inventions in the Arab world, artificial golden woman in Greek myth. Automata have been object of fear, desire, power, used by tyrannical real rulers as tools both in myth and in real life. What new literary possibilities are available when we anchor ourselves in the lineage of that technological imagination? How do these ancient stories and settings provide a useful lens for present anxieties about drones, androids, and artificial intelligence? So that's what we're here to talk about. Um, I'll introduce myself very quickly and then let everybody else have a chance to introduce themselves. Again, um, my name is Walt. I write as WBJ Williams. I'm an information security executive. I have um, title out as an information security person. I have a title, I have a novel out uh, under WBJ Williams. And I have two books coming out in September, one on reality, mythology, and fantasy of unicorns, and one on how to build an information security program from scratch, which I'm certain would bore everybody on this call. Uh, so let's go around the room and we can start out with uh, Jeff. Name's Jeff Ford. Uh, I write novels and short stories. Uh, and I live in Ohio and I teach uh, writing at Ohio Wesleyan University. Which boy? Uh, um, <clears throat> I'm Nikhil Singh. I'm a novelist uh, from South Africa. I'm in um, Zululand at the moment. Um, I have a novel out, Club Dead from Luna Press, which was shortlisted for British Science Fiction Association Award and the Nomos for Best African Novel. Um, I've also got a story coming out in um, the Titan book anthology uh, from the ruins. And I also had a story in the recent Harlan Ellison tribute, um, The Unquiet Dreamer, which is actually about some of these ultimatum. So chat a bit about that later. Um, that thing, so. Ken. Uh, Ken Houghton, uh, former nurse of staffer, uh, long time reader, writer, critic, fan, whatever. Uh, most recent publication was in 2019 in Best of the Scream Factory, uh, a survey of mummy fiction. Uh, in real life, as it were, uh, I work ac access and, and identity management. Uh, the, the 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 soft fuzzy side side of Walt's uh, job. So I'm coming to this from the grand tradition of the Gawam, Frankenstein, Nathaniel Hawthorne, and Microsoft. Excellent. And of course, I come at it from the perspective of somebody who has to deal with artificial intelligence that are trying to attack my organization on a daily basis. I want to start out with um, what is your favorite legend or traditional story about Watamada? And what do you think we can learn from it in this day and age? Uh, I'll start out with which boy? Um, <clears throat> there's many different kinds. You know, um, one of the things that I find interesting about the local traditions, specifically the Zulu traditions spoken about by Krita Mutwa, um, he was a Sangoma. Um, is how uh, automators were started in the ancient past and they were built out of metal and given personalities but they overran people and they, so it was because of this that technology was suppressed in indigenous cultures and they chose to live uh, harmoniously with nature and forests and things as opposed to like develop uh, civilizations based on things so the automator in this way were like a, a way to dispose of technology Though that also leads me to the homunculi of um, you know, the European Gnostic traditions, which are very similar, how things were grown from you know, mandrake roots and then imbued with a kind of um, personality. And then they came up with the personalities were never quite, uh, never quite human, which is the thing about automata. They're, they're never quite human. You know, there's a dif differentiation. So I like that 
myths, mythologies that revolve around that differentiation, no matter how similar we are, there is a dividing line. And I'm interested in that. Ken. Ken, apparently you're on uh, mute. Yep, sorry. Was, on, was, was indeed on mute. Uh, you can tell how well I deal with technology. Uh, okay. Uh, quick challenge to the audience. Uh, see how many references you can make to the REM album that's very similar to this topic title in Discord. Extra credit for night swimming. Um, I'm going to start with uh, my traditional favorite uh, stories. Uh, I mean, obviously, the Gollum uh, is, is is my touchstone, but realistically i gotta i gotta go back i gotta come back to frankenstein i gotta come back to you're trying to create or recreate your memories your future um and nothing ever goes right now there's a there's a revisionist version of frankenstein in which uh he gets along with the old. He get, he gets along with the father in in, in the cabin, and uh, by the time uh, the uh, by by the time the, 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 his daughter and the, the man's daughter and uh, husband come back in, uh, everything is great, bright, bright and peaceful. But it isn't Frankenstein. There's a reason we have traditionally been cautionary in moving our science faster than our humanity. Um, but I also want to look at this another way. Um, and Walt, I'll throw this one out now, but it's not, it's not for discussion at the, at the moment. We'll pick it. Maybe we can pick it up later. If you had, if, if, if you had created the automata this, this, the, the, the automata that we think we can create today, uh, the independent AI machine learning uh, being back in the Fortran days, would we have ever gotten to object oriented programming? <laughs> Interesting. Okay. Let's come back to that. Um, Jeff. I have a lot of favorite stories about automata, but. Uh, one that's my, one of my favorites is uh, I read this book a while ago called The Turk, and it's about a chess playing machine uh, that uh, would take on the great chess players of Europe and the automaton in it, the actual Turk, quote unquote, moved amazingly well, moved the pieces, all that stuff. The only problem was and it also it also smoked the pipe and made comments, which were great, like in this voice, right? The only problem was there was a guy inside of it and he was underneath it, looking up and he would do something to show the Turk where to move the pieces or put a magnet there or something. So the Turk to move the pieces, which turned him into a kind of a machine, the guy that was inside of it. Uh, and uh, it fooled a lot of people. It finally wound up, I believe, in Philadelphia. And it was in a fire. It was on, a, on display in Philadelphia, some like sideshow thing. It was a fire. And out of the fire, they kept hearing the Turk say, your move, your move, as the smoke came out of this place. But uh, the history of this thing and, uh, you know, how it was made and, and the guy that was inside of it, it's a fascinating story. If you can ever see that book, I see it around sometimes still. But if you ever see that book, check it out. It's it's a uh, it's a good automaton story. That's just for starters. I got a million of them. <laughs> well, we'll come back to them. Okay. Let, let's turn this a little on our head. We, we looked at the past. Well, let's look at as we create. All of us are right. Well, all the authors, as we if you're writing fantasy in this day and age, um, how should our experience uh, with modern artificial intelligence uh, flavor our writing, if at all? So how can we pull out of technology into fantasy? 
Do you have to? No. You absolutely don't. Why wouldn't you? Is Jeff? artificial intelligence part of your natural lifestyle? If you're writing a contemporary novel or a near future novel, do you not have to consider what is around you? Jeff. I guess so. the thing that comes that springs to mind, it really probably is off the beaten track from what you guys are talking about. But, uh, you know, the Turing uh, yes. exam to prove whether something is, uh, you know, a, a, an independent life form, that test that he made up. This, yep. is, a, this is a this is a automaton story in a way, mm -hmm. because you could take this test. Uh, and have this discussion with this AI, right? And supposedly, if you can't tell the difference between the AI and uh, you know, you know, and uh, uh, and a real person, that it's passed the test. That means that it is human. That's what it's, that's what he would say, right? So, I mean, this in a lot of ways is uh, defines in a way some of the things that people think about when they think about automatons and stuff. The thing is with Turing's thing is that he sets up a false setting for this test. Mm -hmm. All right. He sets up a false setting as if the only way we ever understand whether somebody is real or not is by what they say. But you usually use all your senses when you encounter someone. You know what I mean? So I think there's a lot of I think there's a lot of hoax involved in, uh, you know, in AI and so forth. I mean, I remember t hearing somebody talk about like how in another 20 years, the robots will be taking over and so forth. But artificial intelligence, I don't get the fact beyond that, if, you know, it's like saying that if you turn this light switch on and off again uh, so many times, the thing's going to become intelligent. I mean, I don't yeah. see that happening. I agree with you. Yeah. I think it's a it's not it's, to agree with <laughs> the system yeah. of limitations, material yeah. limitations, and there's only a finite amount of you know computational value, whereas we're comprised of like an entire half that is non-computational and abstract. How do you you know recreate that in a finite way? Right. I, I don't see it. You know. What's interesting is that they did some analysis of uh, bots to create spam messages uh, against humans that create spam messages. And uh, the bots that create the spam messages were actually more effective in getting people to click on the links in the spam messages than human written spam messages. Um, so that, that's an interesting study that was just completed. Um, a second observation on this is uh, back uh, about three years ago, they uh, did a contest at DEFCON, which is a hacker conference, where they had artificial intelligence-based engines attack uh, human-run computer networks and humans attacking networks run by artificial intelligence engines to see uh, could humans um, meet the rigors of such an attack or defeat them. And the, in both cases, the artificial intelligence won hands down. When Gary Kasparov talked about this um, and how he lost to an artificial intelligence in chess and the loss uh, subsequently of a Go champion to Go, uh, he thought deeply about this and came to the conclusion that humans and artificial intelligence working together were the most um, uh, excellent team and that either of us working solo um, work a bit crippled in this day and age. Ken, what are your thoughts? And then we'll go back to which point. I'm, I'm, uh, I, I, I'm obviously sympathetic to uh, Kasparov. I point out that he, he, beat them, he beat Deep State the first time. He lost to it the second. But coming back to Jeff's point, uh, uh, 20 years from now, I mean, I hate to say it, but if you go back to Woody Allen's comedy routines from 64, <laughs> 68, he does have the one where he's like, uh, 
yeah, the the, the factor the factory uh, got 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 something that could do everything my father could, and that's how he lost his job. And the punchline, of course, was my wife bought one, but that's uh, I don't even want to think about it. Is that fifty years ago at this point, forty five, fifty years. We've been saying mm-hmm. twenty years for a very long time. But and I, my but, refer- but it, my, but it my reference consciousness. It, what it does is it assumes consciousness. Deep Blue, I'll give you amazing machine, right? Beat Kasparov, all that stuff. But it's still a machine, and it's not conscious. That's very true. Exactly. Which, which boy? Well, to put this in an alchemical context, let's say you are studying uh, in one of the older schools to be a sorcerer. One of the first gates that you encounter is the doppelganger. And the doppelganger in especially Egyptian lore and um, also in Eastern European magic, it's, it's a duplicate of yourself, but it doesn't have uh, any heart or soul. But because of that, it's much more intelligent than you are. Uh, so it's a formidable opponent because you're hampered by your heart. Your, your heart damages your ability to be cold. Uh, it, it's, it's the thing is like they view intelligence as a disability in this way, because the overemphasis on intelligence uh, diminishes the intelligence of the soul, and the soul is where we reside. The dreaming, you know, um, they do, they don't dream of electric sheep, you know, and that's the dividing line. I think that you know, if we, it's it's like a you know, you bring up Frankenstein, uh, but I'd you know also like to bring up Pygmalion, because. They're very linked, you know, like Pygmalion for me is a mirror of Frankenstein, but in the social uh, controlling context, it's very much the same thing where you're programming someone to fit into a strata, but it's without the, you know, the the gimmicks um, of science fiction. Uh, I think, you you know, those things, once we develop them, will be perhaps superior to us in some ways. They'll definitely beat us in chess, but it doesn't make us, you know, what we are indivisibly, you know, the, the part that dreams of, you know, abstractions. And that for me is where the seat of consciousness lies, you know. It would certainly be that dreaming is the most human thing we do in some ways. Yeah. So that, that's, so I was trying to turn this into how can we um, um, inform our writing of fantasy and automata and fantasy based upon our experience in the real world with this stuff. But obviously um, another way to look at this is as we write science fiction, um, we've encountered these things. Um, We have the robots that um, clean our floors. We have uh, the spam bots. We have the, all these other robots that we encounter. we, we talk to Siri, we talk to Alexa. Um, we get sometimes interesting responses back from these things. <laughs> so um, as we write about the future, based upon, again, knowing how these things are working today, um, how grounded should we make our vision of the future beyond the limitations and the reality of now? How about we start with you, which boy? What are your thoughts okay. on this one? I think that I've been thinking a lot about the definition of science fiction. Um, and I think, you know, when it had its gestation period in the 40s to the 60s, there was definitely a looking ahead to the possibilities of technology. And in that way, we were able to idealize technology to create um, kind of almost utopian visions of the future. But when you look at the reality that we're living in now, we, we are living in a science fiction reality. So there's a, there's a problem in terms of, how I find, you know, where a lot of science fiction has slid into, you know, trope law, which is, which is not what I consider science fiction. Um, but we, when we talk about, like, being grounded, we don't really have a choice. <laughs> Everything we do is determined. I mean, we're speaking about, you know, these things, like your job even is a very science fiction job but it's you know it is reality um so i i've been looking at it in terms of nature um you know it, in previous times the the commonality is you you'd impose a sort of animal thing on science fiction in the past where there's like a predator and a prey and there's a jungle 
but for me now i've been i've been wanting to write about the internet but i've been wanting to write about the internet in a naturalistic way and for me mm -hmm. the best paradigm i can draw with nature is a cellular microscopic view where everything is about membranes and what passes through things because i don't think we can escape the tablet of nature and i think that's for me the grounding is that we we move towards natural patterns whether we like to or not because those are the limitations of our finite material cor corporeal beings and i think we're moving into a, a microscopic state in a way where everything is about what because things are closer together there's an interchange mm -hmm. of things and it's part of a greater whole it's like a synthesis and once you look at it in that way things become very organic and I think mm -hmm. we will move progressively towards a more organic state when things even look organic and seem organic. So I find this question of being grounded, it's almost like it'll run out of steam within a few years just because it'll catch up to itself. We have no choice but to be grounded within technology. If you, if you create an automaton out of biotech, like all bio, biological processes, is that going to any more have a consciousness than the, than the mechanical ones? Good question. Well, that's, I'm sorry. I'm asking well, you. Asking. Well, you know, I was thinking about um, <clears throat> cyberpunk, uh, what defined it. And the one thing that always came up was a kind of transcendental thing where technology always becomes transcendental to a messiah figure where it achieves consciousness. And I think the, the whole thing is about the seat of consciousness. Mm -hmm. When I, I was speaking earlier about like the alien um, like uh, culture and Zulu mythology, a lot of it is about, a lot of it was taken, you know, by various Western tropes. So it's not, it's, it's sort of contaminated by the perception. But the whole idea was that you had these aliens that didn't really have the same soul value that we did. And everything about them was trying to discover how, what differentiated a seat of consciousness within, and could you transfer that from body to body? And I think that's where technology has always been heading to the point that we're trying to duplicate ourselves. That's what I think. Yeah. Cool. That's folks. it, and that's why that's why I look at it as a cautionary, as always a cautionary tale. You def you define the other is somebody who does not share your values, whether or not they share them, they, they, they share them for, do not share them for a good reason or a bad reason is moot. Once you define them as another, you are at the point where you can treat them as something that is non sub yeah. or super human. Take your pick. I mean, Clark, Clark Kent or uh, Dr. Doom uh, to go to the comic books. Uh, staying, away, staying away from movies. No, no scorsese in here. Uh, but uh, either, either way, it, if you are... The, the question becomes what happens with the people who get left behind? And those, those are the ones I want to... What, those are the ones I'd rather pay attention to than the ones who suddenly solve all of their problems because, hey, we can finally pierce the blood brain barrier so the prions don't have to decay and we can all live forever. And we're still driving cars. We're still finding places to park. We're still needing somebody to clean the streets. Jeff, what are your thoughts on this? I know you you had some interjections, but um, can you rephrase the question for me? Certainly. I forgot what the hell we were what we were talking about? I was, I was just one, yeah, I was just wondering as we as we write new science fiction, since we're interacting with artificial intelligence and automata on a daily basis now. Um, how should we take our lived experiences and turn them into our fiction, specifically our, our fiction that looks forward? Yeah, this is, kind of, this is the kind of fiction I don't write. Okay. I mean, I really don't. I much prefer to talk about, like, you know, what people are feeling at the moment and, and their experiences and so forth. I mean, 
I could conceive of a story, you know, uh, uh, a science fiction story. Um, but I, it's not the kind of stuff I write. I can't, you guys would be do a better job than I would on that one. All right. So uh, no, no, I want to follow that one. Um, yes, sir. I, 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 I don't disagree with him at all because he, he's obviously accurate. Why do you try to stay away from that type of story? Well, I don't necessarily. I mean, I've written sci. I've even written a, a, a you know, a, an, aut an automaton story called uh, "What the Hell's the Name of It?" The Seventh Expression of the Robot General. All right. And this is, you know, whether the robot general is actually conscious or not. I mean, that plays into the story. You know what I mean? That's a big question for me when I hear about, uh, you know, uh, artificial intelligence. Because no example that I've ever seen has, has really shown me or I felt like there was consciousness involved behind it. I just don't think we really understand what the processes are. You know, I see all these things that are like... Uh, you know, stories about where AIs do amazing things and the old robot stories and all that stuff, they always kind of bored me because, yeah. uh, you know, it's like these empty tin cans basically is, you know, is basically the way I saw them. So that's that kind of stuff doesn't really interest me. I don't stay away from it because it scares me or anything. I stay away from it basically because it just doesn't interest me, you know? Right. Fair I mean, enough. I'm interested in automatons and the nature of them. And the idea that, you know, that there, there are things that are hoax and there are things where there's a discussion or a dichotomy between, uh, you know, a mechanical machine and a consciousness, those kind of things interest me. But, uh, you know, science fiction stories about robots or about like, you know, uh, you know, consciousness, I mean, I'm sorry, robots or, uh, you know, aut aut automatons. The only way they interest me is if, like, it's the Sandman by E.T.A. Hoffman. That I'll read, you know what I mean? Or, uh, you know, The King's Indian by John Gardner. Those kind of things. There's an interesting series that came out, um, I believe, late 60s, early 70s. They even made a movie out of one of the books, uh, Colossus. Uh, Colossus, Colossus and the Crab. And I forget the name of the third one. Uh, they turned the first one, Colossus, into the movie The Forbin Project that, that looks at um, artificial intelligence achieving consciousness and um, uh, fortunately or unfortunately being placed in charge of the nuclear arsenal for uh, this nation and at the time what would have been the Soviet Union. And a uh, very, very interesting look at how as an artificial intelligence um, uh, got its own sense of I need to survive and these humans want to destroy me. How do I protect myself from these humans? Um, how do I, since I'm in charge now, what do I do? Do I, um, can I treat them as experimental items, et cetera, et cetera. It was an interesting look at the problem of an artificial consciousness based upon the technology of the time. Also, um, also Hal in uh, 2001. Yes, very much. You know, as they, yeah. they turn him off. He's disintegrating. His his AI is disintegrating. Now, is he conscious or not? I don't You know. He does plot against them. You, mm -hmm. know, what I, you know what I mean? Who knows? I love the fact. Which, which, if you read the sequels, you find out that it's not he's plotting against them. He's literally got two bro programs conflicting with each other. Oh, OK. All right. Yeah. <laughs> And he can't make the decision himself, which is why I want to come back to the question that both you and uh, Witch Boy were making. Uh, and I, I apologize, Walt, it's not on your list and it's not what anything it's you discussed, but you're both making the distinction between intelligence, artificial or otherwise, and consciousness. Uh, is there a way to breach that? I don't know the answer. And Therefore, I'm asking the two of you, and Walt, obviously. Mm -hmm. oh, that's a good question. If I that, I'd be, uh, I'd be wealthy. <laughs> I think I mean. that um, to answer it in a tangential kind of way is every story about 
the creation of a robot or a similar, a similar crow or homunculi is a story about the person trying to play creator to that. Yeah. For me, that's the thing that makes it interesting is the drive to do that, you know, the, the real Prometheus. And um, the only way, and it's usually, it's, it's, it's put down to matter that we have to take things out of matter. And the only way to, to you know, synthesize that is to use outside intelligence of things, whereas the consciousness that drives it in the stories usually becomes the problem. So the stories themselves create a distinction because you view a robot, but you're viewing it generally as a thing. And then you're questioning the, the, the fact that you're questioning, does this thing have a consciousness? You're immediately separating it from having a consciousness. Um, you know, like the same way that Superman was, was based on the golem actually in, um, when they came up with it. And, but, but there you have, you know, you've imbued something, it becomes the Ubermensch and it has a soul now, but it's, it's not quite us. Um, I do draw a distinction between intelligence and consciousness because um, it's the consciousness of dreaming. It's separate to, you know, the consciousness that we use in day-to-day -day life. There is already a kind of dividing line, which we, which we all bridge by being wider. You know? um, so, yeah, it's a complicated question. You ever see that big dog robot? The big dog, they call it, and made by that Massachusetts technology. Oh, company, yeah, Boston Dynamics. Right? Yes. I had a, they, they were showing it online, and uh, they were showing how it recovered from being kicked. They'd kick yeah. it, and it'd fall over, and it'd get back up, you know? A friend of mine hmm. was online talking about that and was upset about the fact that they were kicking it, mm. right? And I was like, it's, it doesn't give a shit. It's a, it's a robot, yeah. you know? what I mean, It doesn't care. But she was, she really felt badly about, you know, it's, it's a dog, it's a dog, you know? And that, uh, I have a hard time dealing with that. Yeah, I, I think from think... inanimate objects is. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> just more disturbing <laughs> than what's made. <laughs> and yet all of us, when we were children, we imbibe personality in inanimate objects. And, mm -hmm. um, we give them very distinct beings separate from ourselves that we maintain over a span of time. And this is something that we all naturally do and we watch our children do. Um, and it is um, one of the way that they learn to interact with others is interacting in play with uh, these inanimate objects into which they have placed a sense of self that is separate and distinct from themselves. And so um, much of what we're doing when we're creating a story is that on another level. And much of what we're doing when we're writing stories about uh, automata is that on another level. And that separation of what is consciousness and what is thought is not something that we can easily separate in ourselves was we are inside the problem. And so we can't easily observe um, where that separation is. One of my favorite lines from information security when we talk about artificial intelligence is how it's neither artificial nor is it intelligent. Though it learns, um, that does not make it intelligent because intelligence is not about learning. It's about making um, in, uh, insightful discoveries of things that never were known before. And that's a very, very different thing. And it depends upon a consciousness. And I'm, here I'm, I'm thinking about Lonigan's philosophical work, Insight, as an example. Um, and um, the, uh, the branch of uh, 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 philosophy, um, epistemology, how do we know what we know? And that can be readily applied whether we're, not, we're, not, we're talking about a dream state or we're talking about a non-dream state. And again, how do you know when you're dreaming? And, and who is the dreamer? Uh, very, very intricate, deep questions that are taking us a little tangentially away from our subject matter, but that's okay, they're fun. Uh, I'm going to pull things back a little bit and just pull something out of um, information security. Um, 
one of the, one of the most important things that we see with um, real automata is how if you give it garbage in your training, you will get garbage out of it. Um, it's a fundamental flaw in artificial intelligence today. And we've seen that flaw used in certain science fiction tropes. Um, so I, I'm wondering, as you write your own fiction, as you're considering automatra, whether or not they be biologically based, spiritually based, uh, mechanically based, um, logically based, computer based, how, would, how are you going to look at the problem of um, how the automatra encounters um, the wrong information and how it can handle that? Uh, Ken, how about we start I'm, with I'm, you this time? Yeah, I, I'm going to steal a quote from Discord. I know uh, it's being tracked elsewhere, but it, it the the quote of the day uh, and the answer to your question is: humans will pack bond with anything. <laughs> it's true. <laughs> and in in that context, if you're tr it, 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 if you are teaching your bots your spam bots, your DDoS bots, whatever bot you want to call them, your three-year-old uh, garbage, they're going to keep going that way, but they're still going to bond with you and they're still going to learn and make that connection. What they are learning is only as good as their programmers and with all due respects to three quarters of the audience and half of the panelists, you and I, Walt, uh, that does not bode well for our future. <laughs> Jeff, what are your thoughts on the subject? On which, what part? Te I teaching. We, I'll tell you one thing. I thought, Walt, I thought that exegesis you gave there was brilliant. It gave me all kinds of ideas. When you were oh, talking. thank you. Yeah, it was really, really good. Uh, made me think a lot of things. Now, what, what's the question, actually? Boil the it quest down for me. The uh, question is, um, as we teach Automatra that we have our characters creating stories, uh, how, do we want, how do we write into the stories how the characters create, uh, respond to um, bad information in ways that is not... Um, stereotypical where can we take this because we're going to feed them bad data at some point you've got a you've got an automaton you're feeding it bad data where is mm -hmm. it going to go nah. yeah where would you take it it might be comical i mean you know talking about descartes before mm -hmm. he was the one that said people were like machines right so an automaton with bad data might be kind of comical in a way, uh, you know. But again, not something I think about. I would think about really. Uh, it. I tell you what is interesting to me though is that how in creating characters in any story, you can imbue them with a kind of soul and consciousness, mm -hmm. which you can't do uh, in. Um, you know, in the physical world yet. I mean, as far as I know, yes. and that's interesting to me. That's e energizing. Uh, the fact that you can create characters that, uh, you know, because w when you read a book or something like that, you see the characters in your mind's eye. I mean, I always do. Uh, and when I write, I see the characters in my mind's eye. And these are people I never saw before. And they're idiosyncratic. And they move and they have volition. And if I try to, if I try to give them garbage or if I try to tell them what to do, they basically kind of lay down and die. Mm. But if you give them the freedom uh, to do, you know, to follow them and follow their story, they'll always take you to the story. And uh, then you just watch and see what happens and record it. But, you know, they do have kind of volition and consciousness, whereas things made in the physical world don't and you put some of the same kind of effort into creating them you know you want them to seem very you know you want there to be verisimilitude you want them to seem realistic to an extent whatever extent the story requires uh and then there's a point though 
where the character becomes real to mm-hmm. me. And then I just follow the character. In the beginning, it's I have to find it. You know, I have to find the character. But once I do, I mean, they become real to me in my mind as far as writing a story. And those are like automatons, I guess, in a way. But ones yes. that are imbued with a feeling and, and feelings and like, uh, you know, and can surprise you. Mm-hmm. you know, they could surprise you and they could trick you and they can uh, have their way with the story, you know. Which Maybe point? I'm just believing that. I don't know. No, no. Mm-hmm. I like what you what you think. Uh, which point? What about you? Actually, it's quite strange because uh, I just wrote a story about this because usually I I, I don't like. I'm I'm very in that camp of not liking to write about things like you know robots and stuff. Mm-hmm. But I I wanted to write a very straightforward <clears throat> cyberpunk story for this anthology that's coming out in September. It's called Malware Park. And it's about this controller who he creates these robots that wander this, you know, desolate world. And it's what you were saying about good information, bad information. So, so the one type that he has, they're very coded to perform certain functions. So they limit violence. They just wonder, you know, and if whatever they come into contact with, they learn from. But their overriding protocols are to like reduce, you know, things like, you know, violence, etc. Mm-hmm. But it's built over the ruins of of mankind, the, all the sunken cities, but no one ever goes down there. And this guy's reached the end of his tether. So what he did is he took another model of this robot and he removed all the safety protocols and he just let it roam in the underworld. And what he did, there's this process that they have of doll riding, which is quite, it's what you were talking about earlier, where you place yourself in the bodily, you, you know, you project yourself cybernetically. So you're in a tank of fluid, so you can move with the thing and it prompts you and you, you learn from them sort of, you know, you pick up their sensory data. It's not like anything that can't be accomplished technologically. But the problem is that the, the robot that he has underneath the ground is, is starting to make up its own rules of what it's learning about nature. It'll stop for like a whole day and fixate on a drop of water. But it'll, it isn't really machine learning of necessary people like the upper droids. It's learning of everything, spiders, you know, like... And it ends up coming back and performing surgery on him and sort of reprogramming him to fit within his, you know, its own parameter. And I think that that's the thing of like bad and good is it's, it's really a question of controlled and uncontrolled because w- when something is good, it's performing its function, something's uncontrolled, you're already letting it sort of, you know, slide. So is that, is it bad? Or that was the question I was trying to ask in the story was, is it, is it a counter evolution or is, you know, at our detriment? Um, because we see something bad would be damaging to our body. It's damaging his body by reprogramming him, but is that, you know, is it bad? So it's, yeah, it's, I've been thinking about that actually quite a lot. Excellent. Because it's doomed Excellent. to happen, I think. You know. It might. Yeah. Very well might. We have a couple of questions that have come in from our audience. From Jesse, we have uh, specifically for Witch Boy, but we'll open it up to, uh, to Ken and to um, Jeffrey after Witch Boy's had a chance to address it, if they have any thoughts. Uh, are there some historical or mythological automatron tropes that you know of that are very rarely used uh, or thought about? Um, There's one that's with- very interesting. Mm-hmm. Uh, it- it's a Zulu uh, creation myth, but it's very strangely, and this is actually something I wanted to bring up. Have any of you read um, Lawrence Durrell's books, uh, Tunk and Nunquam? Not sure. Uh, Durrell, yeah. Yeah, they're my favorite um, automaton story because, it, and it's exactly the same as the Zulu myth. It's very weird. Where um, they try to create a ro- robotic version of the goddess. And they use various models and stuff, but it's so like the goddess that she rebels and tries to destroy them. So in the Zulu myth, you have an ogre who's, he creates all these copies and they're, they're somewhere, they're not made properly. They're like this, they're like that. And he doesn't love them. You know, he only loves the one that's so like it that she runs away and tries to destroy him. And in, in Doral's novel, it's the same. You have this weird corporation and they're, they're trying to build like a Venus, like a real Venus. And she ends up escaping. And I, I really think more people should should look at that as a mythological entrance into automotive stories, because it is some. It's exactly what this question is. It's a really used trope, but it's it's quite mythological. They all hinge on the uncanny valley, that kind of uh, that kind of story. 
you know, that something is either too real or not mm. real enough is that mm. zone. You know what I'm talking about, right? Yeah. Yeah. Yes. The fact that some things are too real or they're not real enough. You know what I mean? There's that space where, uh, where you come up to it, it's acceptable as like a doll or something like that. But then you yeah. cross the line and it becomes yeah. a creep show. Like, you know, mm-hmm. if you ever watch some of these robots they have online, some of them are just creepy as hell. Yeah. You know what I mean? Watching them and they're very realistic looking, you know, and, and actually pretty faces or the handsome faces and stuff. But there's just something really not right there. And knowing I have to say something, I'm going to. You don't have to. Follow, I, I'm going to follow up on on Jeff's comment more than try and expand things. Uh, I as as I mentioned before, I uh, saw uh, Whitney. I will pronounce it properly. Whitney Cummings. Uh, special on sex robots and Mm. if you get to the last 15 minutes of it, I think it's called Can I Touch This? I don't think she stole that from Sheckley, but I'm not guaranteeing it. Uh, But either either way, uh, when when they get to the discussion of how they make the robots, it's like, okay, you can't make them perfectly. They have to have these slight flaws. Otherwise, people won't see them as being human even to that extent. So as we iterate development, I mean, as we continuously improve and improve an agile mindset, and anybody who's not laughing right now, I apologize, or everybody who is, I apologize too. Um, as we continually improve, we make we. What happens in developing your technology is we make better prototypes. The Gollum. You can you can just reach up and erase the AE and it's dead. Frankenstein, you have to kill it. Uh, by the time you get to Rudy Rucker's post singular, which I mentioned in the preliminaries, and you're doing cellular automata, they're all working together and they're learning and growing in the same way that Deep State does. And oh, we got a five minute warning, and I love the next question. So I'm going to stop right there. But I will say that. To date, it's been more Cornbluth and Vonnegut than it has been hard science. Uh, we're going to uh, conquer the enemy. Yeah. And I expect that that will continue for the rest of my life and probably several decades beyond that. Well, you know, what you just were talking about there, as far as like, uh, you know, um, you have to make mistakes in them for people to see them as something yes. that's even close to human. I think about if you, ha- you know, t- taking a re- I'm just talking about religion here as a, in a historical sense, or, you know, I'm, I'm not really religious, but if you take Adam and Eve, is that what God thought? You know, I have to make them a little bit less perfect than I could make them. Otherwise they're not going to be, realistic to me i made you know, Lilith before i made eve image, right he makes them in his image right so does he do the same thing is the uncanny valley freak god out as much as it does us <laughs> excellent question for another panel um we, no it's it's fine it's, it's, it's just it's a wonderful question i love it um we don't have one other question we have just under five minutes um and I'll throw this open to anybody who wants to leap at it. What symbolic roles uh, do you see Automata playing in literature? Uh, we've been fascinated for so long. Um, I'll start. Giving everybody else a chance to think of something sane. Uh, the thing about them is that as with a lot of that 30s, 40s, 50s science fiction, it was countering the other, showing human superiority, being able to conquer or be right or be just or prove yourself as better than the other. Um, I come back to Frank's, I mean, the Gollum, you can turn it off. You have, you have complete control. You have it do the thing that you won't do, and then you stop it. 
Frankenstein, you make the monster, you do, you have to go chasing it down, you have to kill it. Uh, I hate to I hate to go media on at a reader con, but hey, there's only two minutes left. So Twilight Zone episode, original Twilight Zone, that robot pitcher who was so perfect and he's throwing the fastballs and he's getting everybody out. And then they give him a heart and suddenly he doesn't have the heart literally to strike people out. So he's throwing up, he's throwing up meatballs. Everybody's beating them all over the place. It is always, it is and always has been a way to feel better about ourselves that it coincidentally also improves our lives. Um, I got to give Witch Boy a minute here because uh, chomping at the bit right now. Go ahead. Um, the only thing that I really wanted to say was just about that imperfection thing was in, uh, in Roman and Greek art, there is a specific thing, the strabismus of Venus, where you can't create an image of Venus without an imperfection to make it perfect. This, this sacred strabismus, things can't be ideal. Um, in terms of symbolic roles, I think everything in the, the question of automator is, is about like, the more I think about it is about the question of like heart, putting a heart into something and taking and something being heartless. I think for me, that's the absolute crux of whatever story uh, that is the symbolism, you know, being heartless and having a heart and that dividing line. Yeah, it's like the, it's, it's the Tin Woodsman in, in Oz. Mm -hmm. You know, yeah. he gets his heart and you feel bad about it. You feel bad about a machine, you know, and that's what a lot of those 50 stories were. It was about how this machine was so much more honorable or so much more, you know, uh, you know, um, nice or a good person or a, a did a good thing than a human would do. So they're like vessels that we fill our hopes and dreams we fill in, you know, we fill with our hopes and dreams and so forth. I think that's a wonderful place to end it. Uh, we are at time. I, I want to thank my fellow panelists. This has been wonderful. I wish everybody on the other side of the Zoom a very, very wonderful um, future. And I uh, want to thank you all for sharing this uh, hour with us. Thanks a lot, Walt, and thank it's great you, to Walt. talk to you guys. I appreciate it. Pleasure to meet you all. Thank you. Thank you.